Today's webinar is a very fine example of how two different institutions that are geographically close by have done a wonderful job of allowing the transfer and the effective articulation of those students between their two institutions. Additionally, we have one presenter who has had a chance to work on these art types of articulation agreements from a sort of a university administrative uh, sort of standpoint. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce today's panelists, Karen Port, who's a faculty member at Community College of Rhode Island, Dawn Cardus, who is her partner in crime and is a faculty <laughs> member at the University of Rhode Island, and Wendy Harrison, who is at the Colorado School of Mines. So with take it away. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is Karen Kortz, and Don Cardes and I have kind of a joint presentation where we'll alternate back and forth between um, describing our two schools. So I teach at the Community College of Rhode Island, and the Community College of Rhode Island has four campuses throughout Rhode Island. These campuses are both urban and suburban campuses. Um, there really isn't any rural areas in Rhode Island. We have a total of over 17,000 students, and as with most community colleges, most of these students are part-time. Um, we have 37% minorities, um, mostly Hispanic, and this number has been increasing um, quite dramatically recently. Um, and again, our numbers are fairly typical for community colleges. Our average student age is almost 26 years old. Okay, next slide. So this is Dawn, and I'll pick up from here for a moment. At the University of Rhode Island, where I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Geosciences, um, we actually have one main campus, the Kingston campus, presented first there uh, with a cluster of colleges. And then there's the Narragansett Bay campus, which holds the Graduate School of Oceanography. Um, and actually, there's lots of tight links between the oceanography program at the Narragansett Bay campus and our geosciences program here on the main campus. Um, for any who are interested, the undergraduate program is kind of a combined effort. Um, and then there's also the Feinstein Providence campus, which has continuing ed and lots of night courses. Um, so some of our students who are commuting students pick up a couple of classes through that campus. Um, and then the Alton Jones campus, which is an environmental education focused space that's kind of a, a farther satellite from campus. And we have about just over 13,000 undergraduate students, uh, currently over 2,000 graduate students. And I would say, when I, when I went and looked at the stats, almost 60% are Rhode Island um, in terms of their primary address, and 40% thus out of state, and about 20, just around over 20% of incoming freshmen self-identify as students of color, and I would say that's also increasing. And in general, in our in our college, um, it's slightly higher, but over across the campus, um, it's a 16 to 1 student to faculty ratio. Actually, in geosciences, our courses tend to be a little bit smaller than many in even our College of the Environmental Life Sciences. So we have a um, sometimes double majors with other same college programs are surprised that they're in classes of 20, 16 to sort of 24 students. Uh, but that's us in a blink of an eye. Next. Right, and this is a, just a quick snapshot of our homepage where it kind of revolves around uh, big thinkers in the lower left. So there's faculty profiles or some of our grad, graduate students who get exciting grants. But this is kind of the, the hub for all of our um, communications out to current and prospective students. And um, it's been renovated recently, so hopefully it's a little more user-friendly. Next. Okay. Um, so back to uh, Community College of Rhode Island. Um, the, we teach geology um, out of the physics department. So I'm actually a geologist, and I'm a member of the physics department. And there are four full-time geologists, um, which sounds like a lot, but then uh, there are with the four different campuses we have at CCRI, uh, we're actually scattered around. So um, I am the only geologist on my campus. And uh, due to the nature of Rhode Island, students do not really travel between campuses much at all. Um, the geology, we offer many different introductory courses, um, but only two of them transfer uh, as a geology major requirement to the University of Rhode Island. and that's the intro physical course, 
um, which has an annual enrollment between the four campuses and the four professors of about 250 students. And then historical geology, um, which does not have a prereq. Um, it is its own kind of intra-level course. And that um, we don't offer as much. It has an annual enrollment of about 50 students. Um, between the four professors, we have about 10 students a year um, express interest in transferring to URI in the geosciences. Um, and I don't know actually how many end up doing it. Um, that's something that we don't track very well. That's something we are, uh, we'd like to do better. Next slide. I agree. Um, we're interested in tracking majors from all the different sources um, and then how they do when they get out of URI. So here's this, from my perspective, at the University of Rhode Island, I'm one of the undergraduate advisors for the um, undergraduate program. And we have about 70 right now spread across the four years and it's increasing. So we're right now at a time of reckoning where we're going to probably have to you know, peti petition for additional TA allocations to cover more lab sections of courses and it could be that some of our core classes will um, go from something like 20 up to more like 30 or 32 students if the current crop of incoming students um, continues. And in the, in the program here we have six full-time faculty in geosciences plus an associate dean from our department who covers a course per year and then a full-time lecturer right now um, that we're trying to brace ourselves in case we should, we should lose her going forward. Um, it's also a very active hiring time at URI, I should add. So um, the geosciences is featured in a number of different proposals for new faculty going forward and we're, we're quite hopeful. Uh, the undergraduate teaching program is here on the main campus. There is synergy with the 10 plus geological oceanographers at the Graduate School of Oceanography. So we purposefully um, match some of our advanced undergrads with oceanography professors for research internships, that kind of thing. Um, and the curricular plan for all of our majors has a core, which is six lab courses plus supporting electives, which come from geo, but also we have sibling programs in natural resource sciences that deal with soils and GIS. And for some of our students, there's some more resource economics courses that they choose to plug into their supporting electives. And then we have a, a, a pretty rigorous supporting sciences core, uh, two semesters each of biochem, physics, math, and stats, um, plus the general education requirements of the college. And I'll just add that one of the things that distinguishes our major, a Bachelor of Science in Geology and Geological Oceanography, one of the things that sets us apart from some of our sibling programs on our campus is actually that we ask students to complete two semesters of physics and calculus. So it's, um, we're, we're also interested in, in enhancing some of our tutoring and our math education um, work here at URI because it does seem to be a stumbling block for many, not just in our major. But next slide, please. Um, so at CCRI, uh, there are quite a few things I do to help encourage uh, geology major transfers. Um, so in my own classes, I emphasize the jobs that geologists have. I have a local hydrogeologist come in and actually give a guest lecture about what he does and um, it locally, and then students can answer, ask questions uh, about that. Um, I do talk about the AGI website. Um, and you know, tell students to go check that out if they have more questions. Um, but then, kind of more specifically, I if I have a student who says that you know they're somewhat interested, um, and I then connect that individual student with uh, Don Cardes at URI, so they have a direct person to ask for uh, if they have any questions. And then um, at the end of the fall semester, I. Uh, organize with Don Cardes a pizza lunch. Um, and so I invite, well I'll talk about that actually more in a second, so um, to kind of go through the list. Um, and then I also give students information about our joint admissions agreement um, between CCRI and URI. And again, we're, we're going to talk about that in more detail in a little bit. Don, our next slide. Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll add to those things. Once at URI, we really do welcome and encourage geology major transfers or double majors. So I try to really have ready information to advisees. Right now I have about 50 students on an email listserv 
and I use sort of a chat room function on our online Blackboard, the Sakai, we use Sakai here at URI, and so during my office hours, I often will open up that chat window and just fire off a general announcement that, you know, the doctor is in, what questions have you. Um, I try to be visible and supportive at transfer student orientation events, so they like to have, you know, a contact person on hand for every program, and, you know, we can't make them all, but we, we do our best, and so there's one other undergrad advisor in the, in the program, and we alternate, but somehow I, I Usually I'm, I'm free then. Um, we, I add new transfer students, usually alerted by Karen Courts at CCRI. She'll send me, you know, the names and I can go find them in the um, register here. And I add them manually to our geo-advising email list so they start to get, you know, emails about departmental coffee breaks or anything like that that's going on. Just try to bring them in here to our hall so that they see us as a, as a community. And I do try, I italicize that, I try to arrange individual student meetings early in the fall term, but um, so I send out sort of a, an invitation to my advisees, but then I schedule what I call drop-in advising um, for, you know, a block of an afternoon or morning and um, tell everybody I'm there for the entire block and they should just drop in with friends or on their own. And those seem to be, maybe until they meet me, those are less intimidating, so they work pretty well. Um, and I do poll students in the in the major courses, the core courses, about you know where did you take Geo 103 or you know your equivalent courses? Um, did you all like? I try to acknowledge that I have students that I meet at the 300 level Earth Materials course, and they've had intro concepts with Karen Quartz or other professors up the road at CCRI, or you know they're transferring it from all over the place. So I try to be. Uh, pretty sensitive to that and, and try to get their prior learning, at least on my radar. And I, I also am, am very happy at the last bullet here to award independent study credit for joint research or internship experiences. In fact, I'm the one who runs our 300 level internship course for geosciences and so some of that has been useful for our transfer students who come in with um, different experiences, either from work at, done at CCRI or um, maybe they're active uh, with Save the Bay or some regional environmental organizations, and um, so we, we talk out and sort of codify that experience so that they can earn credit. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so this is Karen again, and I mentioned that I have a uh, pizza lunch for students, and this is l held at CCRI, so the students, it's actually held in the students' lab room, so they don't have to travel anywhere to go to it. It's very easy for them. Um, I hold it at the end of the fall semester, and there's generally about 10 to 15 students that um, attend. And what I do is I make an announcement to all the students in my classes, if you're interested in learning more about the geoscience program at URI, um, either uh, becoming a major or having it as a minor or you just are somewhat interested um, or you might want to transfer to another school but are interested in geology, you know, come to this lunch. And um, then, I, so I make that announcement, but then another thing I do, which I think is even more effective, is I personally invite, so I write out an invitation um, to all students in my class that have an A, um, or who have kind of, I've talked to separately and they've expressed an interest in geology. Um, and I think the personal invitation makes a big difference versus just a general announcement. I also um, email the other CCRI ge geology faculty and uh, ask them to announce and invite students in their classes too. So um, I get a couple students that attend the lunch that way, although they have to travel between campuses and that doesn't happen very much. Um, this, uh, when Don and I originally had this idea to have this pizza lunch, um, we were the ones that paid for it. We kind of split the bill. And, I mean, there's not that many students, there's not that much pizza, so it wasn't too expensive, but um, now uh, Dawn has been able to convince her department that this is an important recruiting tool, and they're, they uh, pay for the pizza now. Okay, next slide. Right, here's, here's what, um, for, for the undergraduate student who's thinking about taking advantage of the JAA between our programs, they would go to this, it's actually a new website, I think it's been up just a year or so because um, it feels fairly recent and even my memory, there was an older, more kludgy 
web page before then. So this is ritransfers.org, and you'll see that on the under under the the big anchor seal there. Um, you get information here about how courses transfer between university and college um, organizations in the state, some information about gen ed and program transfer plans, but then that blue, that sort of light blue um, tab is the joint admissions agreement between our programs, so I think that that's the next screenshot I took, if you can advance to the next slide. Right, so when you hit that JAA agreement, you get just a few little nuggets of information. The JAA is a program for this clear pathway for students to get their associate's degree first and then transfer. Um, if, if you want to do geology, it's to the University of Rhode Island. And what I really, I wanted to make sure those three benefits showed up as bullets on the slide. So it's the 60 transferable credits that apply straight to the bachelor's degree. And a little bit, I, I don't know, I know what we do in GEO about these special advising sessions, and I'll, I'll hope that other programs have similar patterns. But that third bullet is that for the, the very high performing students with the high GPAs, they get this tuition discount, which can be, you know, tens of percent, I think, I want to say it was over 20 percent of a tuition discount for students who get active in the JAA early, so they commit to it while they're at CCRI, and that's the glitch here. But if they can get into the program at that stage in their academic planning, um, when they actually transfer then to URI with that strong GPA, they, it, there is a strong benefit to them. So that was really the, the motivation um, beyond I think what I think is healthy community building, the sense that for those motivated students who know this is their career path, we're also trying to make it financially more sensible to them. So what, the next, please. Right. So when, when students actually scroll down and find our program, this is what they see. So uh, this is what I was editing with our dean's office uh, last year. So on the left column there is, you know, while they're at CCRI and they're getting the general studies program, one model for their core curriculum. And there is a little bit of flexibility in there, but this is meant to be, you know, a, a strong backbone for those students. And then if you go to the middle column uh, at URI, the BS in Geology and Geological Oceanography, you can see how uh, once they transfer what the equivalent courses are and how they slide in to fill up most of the general education requirements. So if you're kind of scanning back and forth, you would see, for example, in writing and communications, on the left column for CCRI, they're taking English 1010, and when they show up here with their transferred credits, I say, aha, you took the equivalent to writing WRT 104, 106, and I can check that box. And it's fairly neatly done. Um, what I'll add, too, is that down in the bottom, uh, where it says sort of major requirements under both of these columns. You can see that we're encouraging students to take physics before they come to URI and uh, basically take the two courses that transfer neatly right into our program and get started with their bio sequence as well. And for the students who do this, I would say they walk in and they're really running with the pack and they can um, kind of slide in smoothly to the ongoing curriculum. Right. So. Oh, um, go ahead. So, so I would like to add a little bit of a caveat to this, is that um, Don um, worked with URI, and this is a pure URI document, CCRI just kind of rides along with it, um, but it worked with URI, and so, you know, this is a great document, it's really wonderful that the students can transfer, they can get 30% off of their tuition at URI. Um, the problem is, is to enroll in the JAA program, students need to basically be in their first year of mm. college um, at CCRI, and, uh, but I've polled my students for the past few years, and I have almost no students who are in their first um, year. Usually they save their science, lab science requirement to the end, and so that's most of the students that I have. And so I, I love this idea. Um, it's just where it, it, it's a very recent um, thing that we've created here, and I'm not sure we're, we're kind of working to figure out how useful it is to the students. Uh, yes. Um, was this, um, did we skip a slide? Could we just check quickly? No. No, that was it? Okay. Yep. 
Um, well, I'll go ahead and, and mention that some ways that would be uh, sort of forward-looking to build and strengthen the relationship. Um, I could really see joint courses across institutions connecting students and credits, more credits towards the major. Um, I'd really be interested in that the second point, strengthening the introductory geo experiences across institutions. We have multiple professors, even here at URI, handling in a single semester the same you know, course. Um, so we've got all these, I, I was going to say competing course models, but I don't know that they're competing, they're just not all complementary. Um, and we're, we're doing some outcomes-based assessment right now and, and are trying to prepare for some remodeling of the curriculum. Joint field trips would be reasonable, and I think our independent programs could really benefit from that if we can find the logistical support. And lastly, with the question mark, is the IU's proposal. Um, just given some of the recent calls and, and um, kind of webcasts about what the program at NSF is looking for, uh, it seems that we might have some good grist for the mill for, for a nice focused IU's proposal that might deal with you know our, our intro labs or something like that. And so one of the things that we want to kind of ensure as we're having our discussions is that as URI is changing their, their program, um, we would like CCRI to be involved in that discussion just to make sure that you know, everything still flows together smoothly for the students. Agreed. Mm. So I think it's appropriate for me to step in at this point. Yes. Um, this, this is Wendy, and um, in fact, uh, what I'm going to say next really builds very nicely on some of these final points about your, your joint agreement. Um, I'm, I'm talking now from the perspective of being the Associate Provost for four years um, during a period where we were significantly expanding our um, agreements with the local community colleges. Uh, so I'm going to bring more of the administrative and big picture look at this. Um, one of the things I want to start with, though, is to tell you that um, if you don't know about the School of Mines, it's very specialized. And because it's very specialized, we have to pay quite a lot of attention to um, success in our um, transfer students. Um, all of our degree programs are applied science and engineering. All of them are between 130 and 140 credit hours. Um, we have a common core of 44 credit hours across all um, of our degree programs. And this is going to be our, what we call our articulation core, and that's the same as your joint agreement. Um, it's not 60 hours, it's 44. Um, our retention rates across uh, students, 90% for the first year, 80% for the sophomore year. And our graduation rates are pretty typical for engineering. Um, that's a heavy course load, so 40% are graduating at four years and 72 by six years. But where we really excel is our placement. Our geological engineering students are placed at the end of, the first, at the end of their uh, first degree, bachelor's degree at 95% rate with a starting salary average of $57,000. Our geophysics students place at 100% with a starting salary two years ago around $83,000. So we've got some things that are, are working for us pretty well. Next one. Um, once in a while, we, we hit the newspaper. Um, we did in, in 2012 when I was working on this project. I'm sure you can read all this. One of the things that I was uh, interested to hear you say was about the requirement that the students enter your joint admissions program. Um, already a student. Well, you can see this young man was uh, doing manual labor at Coors when he enrolled. Uh, of course, he doesn't get a tuition discount, but uh, he, he went to our local community college, Red Rocks Community College, um, came into the School of Mines, um, and graduated as a petroleum engineer with a starting salary of $100,000. It's one of those great stories that administration likes to have. Next one. So I want to tell you about our relationship with Red Rocks from the administrative point of view. This is a very long-standing partnership. Um, we, we have a, they're local, they're, they're about five miles away. And today we have five articulation agreements and they were all modeled on our success with Red Rocks Community College. Our articulation students amount to about 10% of the entering class each year. 
um, we can show because of our long-standing relationship with one of them that they perform at the same level in terms of retention and grade point average, etc. Um, strategically, from an administrative point of view, these agreements allow us to navigate some complexities of the State Commission on Higher Education mandates, such as um, what we call 60 plus 60, which means you've got to get people out with 120 credit hours. And I've just told you that we need 130 to 140. So we're always, um, always, uh, we can always justify this, but we have to navigate it each time. And the articulation agreements are very positive uh, for us in administration. Uh, we, we are very proactive with the Colorado Department of Higher Education, faculty to faculty conferences, and the General Education Council, where we are always in contact with other two and four year institution administrators. Uh, next one. So what about some of the challenges um, and the resources that we need to do these things? Um, our experience is um, these programs work if we bring together the faculty from the two-year colleges and the faculty from the four-year colleges. That's going to be what it makes. It's no good the administration saying, do this. It has to be a, a real interest on both sides to make it work, and I think you've heard that in the previous uh, discussion. Um, we have to have the faculty with a common agenda, which is the commitment to the success of a diverse student body. And everybody has to agree upon what's going to be delivered in the curriculum. This is very important for us in these more specialized science and engineering focused topics, because we need to know that what's in Calculus 1 and Physics 1 and Chemistry 2 is really delivered. And, and we know that that's a challenge sometimes, particularly in the community colleges if they have to unexpectedly bring in adjunct faculty. Um, we, we have to really be sure that, that the curriculum is delivered. Because otherwise what happens is the students come in and they're not going to have the groundwork for statics and fluids and mechanics, um, and they won't do well. Um, we have to be sure that the community college students in these programs know that they're coming into a rigorous curriculum. Um, so we're worried about their preparation. Um, their social preparation is different. We have very good um, resources for our community college students. They are often more mature, have different family lives. Uh, we put all students in a adjusting to college seminar and some of these um, transfer students go into their own section of that because they can support each other in a different way than a 17 or 18 year old. Um, we provide good academic support from them. Personal support has got to be um, more tailored. We're expecting them to come in and perform and they know that. They know that. Finally, on the administration end, um, we find that it's important that the faculty and the staff really know what's going on. Um, we have a lot of faculty on our end at the uh, Institution of Higher Ed that only vaguely know what it means to come from the articulation agreement. They have, are perhaps misinformed. Um, our admission and registration um, officers are fully on, in line. Um, it's a point that we continue to make that articulation agreements guarantee course substitution but not admission. The students still have to apply. We participate in all the um, information sessions that uh, we have for incoming students, high school students, etc. as you've previously heard from the last speakers. Next one. <laughs> so um, how do we make it work on our campus? Uh, we have two teaching professors. These are permanent non-tenured faculty um, on administrative salary supplements who coordinate the academics. It's their project. That's to make sure that uh, Everybody knows what's in the curriculum and uh, keep up with assessment, et cetera. We have a committee which was managed by the associate provost. It was me at the time we put this in place, which was made up of the registrar, the director for the Center of Engineering Education, the associate dean of student life, the director of admissions, and the two faculty coordinators as a way of communicating internally and externally. And we actually, and this is an aside, um, we then added a teaching professor who was emerging as the campus-wide uh, research experiences for undergraduate education coordinator to this team. Uh, because many of our 
uh, increasingly uh, our research active faculty would like to have uh, community college student involvement in the big research projects. So that's, I think, the end of uh, my contribution at this point. So now we have some time for um, discussion and questions for our speakers. Again, as a reminder, if you have a question and have a microphone um, and would like to ask your question directly to one of our speakers, all you have to do is press the, press the little raise your hand button on that uh, control panel and I can unmute you. Um, if you would not like to speak, you have the opportunity to type in your question in the chat box and I can facilitate those. All right, we have one coming in. This is for Karen. Um, Karen, did you have any prior connection to URI before you became a faculty member at CCRI? Uh, I did actually, yes. Um, I had initially worked with one of the professors at URI um, as um, on the Space Grant. Um, so we were both involved as being our campus representatives for Space Grant. Um, so we met at a few meetings. And then um, when I decided to go back to school and get my PhD, I got it at URI, so I got to know the professors there as well. Um, one, um, one of the things that, uh, and uh, this was before Don was even at URI, but then Don and I met uh, because we were both um, involved in a, uh, a large grant um, for workshops for uh, K-12 teachers, and so we were both um, leading workshops and um, involved in that grant, so we got to know each other that way, and we've continued our uh, working relationship and friendship um, as a result of that. Great. Um, question for Dawn, actually. Typically, how many students participate in those research or internship activities you spoke about in that last bullet point on that slide? Well, it, it's varying and growing. Um, mm -hmm. I think the first, so it's been going about three years. The first year I only had, I think, three students who earned internship credit, but we normally have six or eight students who do a research internship over with oceanography faculty and maybe a few more, maybe up to a total of 12 students doing research internships if you count those who work with um, geoscience professors here on the main campus. So we all uh, support independent study projects with the uh, undergrads. Um, and now contrast that with the current year, I would say I've, we've got maybe six students earning internship credit this semester, and I expect um, almost that number again in the spring. And then for research experiences, which are more defined as having a lab-based component where the student's analyzing their own data and um, often producing like a data report or a PowerPoint presentation that they share. Um, that could be up this semester. I'm just doing the math in my head. Up to about 15. So those are creeping up. And I think part of it is is just word of mouth and I started having these coffee breaks at the end of every semester where the students who did an internship um, are invited to do a little 15-minute presentation showing pictures of themselves at the internship and we have you know coffee and bagels and so the younger students are dropping into that now and seeing it which I think is sustaining it. Awesome, great! And um, one other thing to add to that is that uh, Don has worked with um, a couple of my students who have done some research with me, giving them credit at URI also um, through some of the internship and programs. Great. Um, here's a question for Wendy. How, much, um, how many students per year enter your program from Red Rocks Community College? Um, well, I would... Red Rocks, I don't have the tip of my finger, but all five colleges mm -hmm. contribute about um, 100 okay. students. And they're going to typically, because it's 44 credit hours they can bring, they typically come in um, during the sophomore year. So they either come in at the beginning of the sophomore or no later than second semester sophomore. Okay. And how much time did it take to get these arrangements um, in place with Red Rocks Community College and the others? So, so Red Rocks is harder to say because it happened over a long period of time, many, okay. many years. Um, so the, the more recent ones, on average, it takes about a year, mm -hmm. starting with um, a faculty member 
identified at the four-year college and a faculty member identified at the two-year college to work together and then a proposal sort of works its way up through the two administrative strings on either side. Gotcha. So, and what were some of like the, the challenges that you've encountered along the way with, with building those relationships? I think the biggest challenge is to make sure that the quality, the, the, the curriculum content and the and the, the learn well, let's start with one thing at a time. The curriculum content for us is everything. Because we have to know for the students to be successful when they come into, say, a sophomore level mechanical engineering course, or they come into soil mechanics or you know ge a ge geology class, that they've got the the background, right? Because we don't know what's being taught in the freshman year when the freshman teacher isn't in the office next door to us, right? So that's so the curriculum content is very important. But the second part is um, we we I think we have to get used to the idea that the students are jumping in terms of their the expectations of their academic performance, whereas they might have had a lot of one-on-one -on -one individual coaching and um, um, support. When they come into, say, the middle of the sophomore year or even the beginning of the sophomore year, they're surrounded by students who are already in high gear, right? Mm -hmm. who are taking 18 credits a semester and they've all got homework and they are all kind of numerical, well, not all of them, that, but they're all focused. and. Um, we, we have found, actually, that because the students know where they're coming and the community college instructors know how these students are going to have to perform in order to be successful, that they come in very well prepared. And, and that's why they perform at the same level as the other students. Excellent. It's, and very, it's, very, it's very exciting, actually. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, does CSM have any special events that they do at the two-year colleges? Like, do you have, like, pizza lunches or any other types of things that kind of get the students to learn more about what's going on at CSM? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that Whether at this time. We always invite um, the community college to participate in, to any extent that they want in our... Um, I don't know what you all call these. We have several events for incoming students. Discover CSM, explore, mm -hmm. where, where you bring different universities do this in different ways. We run three a year, and they're progressive students who've been accepted and but haven't decided. Mm -hmm. And always the community colleges uh, can, if they choose, participate in those. Um, at, I would have to say that if any one of our community college partners picked up the phone or sent an email and said, can you show up next week? There is no question we would. Yeah, absolutely. It's because we have this team approach on the campus to managing it, and one of that group of five would go. Mm -hmm. We really value this relationship. Wonderful. Um, question for Karen, actually. Once the students transfer to URI, do you ever get to hear back from them? Do they tell you how, how it's going? Do you do any like kind of informal mentoring or advising or anything like that? Um, I hear back from them on occasion, mm -hmm. um, and usually that's prompted by an email for me, how's it going? <laughs> and, of course. Um, and I do hear back from students that way. And I mean, it, it seems that the ones I hear back from do pretty well. Um, I also do try to talk to some of the professors at URI and find out um, how my students who transferred are doing. Um, in fact, I did that. Uh, few days ago at GSA, ran into a professor, and he's like, did you have so-and-so as a student? I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, <laughs> how, how is she doing? Um, and, uh, but I, I mean, I find, I mean, I, of course, get busy with my own new students, and so it's, it's tough to kind of informally track them. And I, I think this is something that um, CCRI and URI can work together a little bit better on, is doing a little more formal tracking of these students. Um, because, I mean, my, my colleagues at CCRI also have students that transfer, and, and I think just as a whole, we'd like to kind of learn more about what the needs are um, at URI, URI for these students. Yeah, absolutely. Well, those are all the questions we have for now. 
Um, are there any last minute questions from the audience? Feel free to type them in or you can press the raise your hand button and I can unmute you. You can speak to our uh, speakers directly. I'll give you a couple seconds here to type in your questions if there are any left. Nope, I don't see any coming in. Actually, well, this is uh -huh. this is Dawn. Can I ask a brief question? Yes, of course. <laughs> and this is sort of directed to you, Wendy, um, about the having a really firm grip and understanding of the introductory curriculum. Was that something, how did you establish that? Because I think right now, uh, one of my points early in the webinar was that we've got, you know, different models for the intro courses and not all seem to be quite complementary. So we're, we're now, in, you know, looking for strategies going forward. Did, did you, uh, was that sort of a top-down approach no. to revision of curriculum or how did you get to this, to, to so where you are? This is a really good question, actually. Um, it, it's a two-way approach. Uh, first of all, in, in terms of courses, let's just take Calculus 1, Physics 1, Chemistry 1. Um, for those, there's a, there's a set curriculum that we know, based upon assessment needs for accreditation, we know that the students have to cover certain topics. Um, it's no different than admitting a student from, um, I don't know, university a student, there's a, there's a look at what this student took and a decision is made by admissions about whether there's a deficiency. So, so there's a set of courses where there's not much flexibility that we can entertain, either from the community college or from any other university. But then there's another set of courses, and, and I haven't talked much about those, and for example, Earth System Science, or mm -hmm. that's what we call our basic a science course is one of those, and um, we we are more tolerant. Right? Does it cover the basic principles of um, what we expect the students to know about the Earth and how the Earth systems work, and has it got enough of the material that they're going to need when they go on into mineralogy or petrology, um, regardless of how the particular course was. Um, designed. And, and there are, the reason that we only transfer 44 instead of 60 credits is there are a couple of things in our first two years that the community colleges don't feel they have the capacity to deliver. Um, so, so it's a bit of a two-way street. 